So hello and welcome to yet another episode of Biographics. I'm your interim host, Carl Smallwood. That's Carl with a K and Smallwood with a, a small and then a wood. And today we're talking about Paul John Knowles, the Casanova killer. Now, ordinarily, I really don't like making content that concerns like true crime. I was informed by the people behind the scenes, the producers and the owners of the channel, that the true crime genre is popular with the specific demographic of women aged 25 to 35. And since that's a demographic I would like to be popular with, I decided to make an exception. Speaking of which, links to my socials can be found below, as can the socials of the author of today's video, Radu Alexander. But without further ado, let's get to it. Paul John Knowles had a, a way with people, especially with women. His charms, his good looks made people trust him just innately and he could lower their guard. British journalist Sandy Fawkes, for example, once described Knowles as, and I quote, tall, well over six foot, broad shoulders, narrow hips and as slender as a wraith. And a sort of like a cross between Robert Redford and Ryan O'Neill. And as you will soon find out, she had a fairly, shall we say, unique personal perspective on this rather ruthless killer. All of this, though, was for show. Beneath that affable, confident persona was hiding something altogether darker. Ever since he was a small boy, Paul Knowles had decided that the rules and laws weren't really meant for him. They were sort of guidelines he could choose not to follow, and that he could just take whatever he wanted and do whatever he pleased to anyone he felt like. His entire life was one steady escalation of brutality and sadism, from petty theft to robbery to sex crimes and ultimately to murder. A four-month-long savage killing spree left at least 18 people dead, and in custody, Knowles showed no remorse or regret over his numerous crimes, and soon after left the world the only way he knew how, violently. Paul John Knowles was born on April 17, 1946, in Orlando, California, the son of Thomas Jefferson Knowles and Bonnie Strickland. We can't really tell you much about his childhood. We only really know that Knowles bounced around a few foster homes in his youth and that he started stealing from a very, very early age. Then, when he was 18, he escalated things quite considerably. After being stopped for questioning during a traffic incident by a police officer in Jacksonville, Florida, Knowles held the patrolman at gunpoint and kidnapped him. Eventually, he released the officer unharmed, but you can't really get away with kidnapping a police officer and have nothing bad happen to you. So the criminal was arrested and convicted, and on April 21st, 1965, the 19-year-old Knowles was sentenced to five years in prison for kidnapping, which seems rather low, right? Especially when it's like your first crime. No one's first crime is aggravated kidnapping of a police officer. He's wild. And speaking of which, Knowles was released early because it was his first arrest, but Knowles would become very familiar with the inside of a prison cell. Over the next decade, he spent more time behind bars than he did as a free man, serving on average seven months a year, mostly for thefts and burglaries. While doing a three-year stretch in Rayford, Florida, Knowles started putting his charm to work on the Pen Pal program. He began corresponding with a divorced woman from California named Angela Coe. She visited him in prison a few times, and before you knew it, he popped the question, and she said yes, and she even paid his lawyer's fees to secure Knowles an early release and found him his job as a sign painter. What could possibly go wrong, I say, four minutes into a 20 minute long video about a serial killer? After being paroled in May of 1974, Knowles travelled to San Francisco to meet with his new betrothed. Angela was finally with the man of her dreams, but fortunately for her, her survival instincts kicked in, and they began screaming, girl, get the hell out. And after only a few days together, she realised that Knowles was not the kind of man she thought he was. She got a sneak peek at the darkness hiding underneath a veneer of friendliness and seduction, and she understood that he was trouble, later stating that her fiancé projected an aura of fear. Kovic broke up with Knowles and survived her encounter with a man who would come to be known as the Casanova Killer for reasons that will become abundantly clear in about five minutes. Others were not so lucky. According to his own confession on the day he got dumped, Knowles took out his anger on a few unfortunate residents of San Francisco and killed three random people in a single night. Police could never verify these three victims or if the crime occurred as Knowles described, but it is worth pointing out at this stage that Knowles confessed to a lot more killings than the authorities could ever confirm. And we only know of 18 people people who were definitively killed by Knowles during his crime spree, but he would in prison confess to of murdering up to 35. And what made Knowles so terrifying a criminal is that he killed pretty much indiscriminately. He would kill people of all ages using different weapons, in their homes, on the street, in the woods. There was no 
pattern to what he did, which made it very difficult to establish an accurate timeline of what he did or figure out what he was going to do next. And whether or not these three would have been his first murders, we cannot say, but we certainly know they weren't his last. So even if those were made up by Knowles to just taunt the authorities, it would not be long until the brutal killer would begin his murder spree in earnest. After his rampage in San Francisco, that may or may not have happened, Knowles returned to the familiar surroundings of Jacksonville, Florida. There he got into a bar fight and stabbed a bartender on July 26, 1974. Police arrested him and placed him in custody, but Knowles managed to break out of his detention cell and make his escape. Poor John Knowles was now on the run and would show little mercy for the people who were unfortunate enough to cross his path. Noel's first confirmed kill took place the same night he escaped from custody. He broke into the house of a 65-year-old woman named Alice Curtis, subduing her and leaving her bound and gagged as he ransacked her home for valuables. Once he'd finished robbing her, Noel's got into her car and drove off into the night, leaving Curtis to choke to death on her own gag. And that killing may have been unintentional, with Noel simply just not caring what happened to his victim after he left her home, but the next murders he committed were not only completely targeted, but showed that the heartless Noel's had no real compassion for anyone who crossed his path. His next victim was a 13-year-old girl named Ima Jean Sanders who disappeared from Warner Robins, Georgia on August 1st while hitchhiking. Her remains were not found until two years later in the woods in Peach County, but it wouldn't be until 2011 that she was definitively identified using DNA. And it gets worse from here, folks. So, yeah, while I would like to say that's about as bad as it gets, it isn't. Again, I say this eight minutes into a 20-minute recording about a serial killer. So on that very same day, Knowles tried dumping the car he stole from Alice Curtis since the authorities were looking into it, but two young girls had the misfortune of seeing him commit the crime. These were Lillian and Milette Anderson, who were 11 and 7 years old at the time, respectively. The remorseless Knowles had no qualms about kidnapping and strangling them both to death, burying their bodies in a swamp. Just one day after this, Knowles forced his way into the house of a 49-year-old Marjorie Howe and did the same thing he did to Alice Curtis. So this time, he did not leave her to fate or chance and strangled her before robbing the home. He repeated the act on August 23rd when he broke into the home of a 24-year-old Kathy Sue Pierce in Musselor, Georgia and strangled her with a telephone cord. Pierce had a three-year-old son in the home who was thankfully left unharmed, one of the exceptionally few cases where Knowles displayed a shred of mercy. September was a big month for the murderous drifter as he passed through Ohio, Alabama, Mississippi, Texas and Nevada, leaving bodies behind in all states. Some of these victims were simply people who were in the wrong place at the wrong time. For example, there's an elderly couple called Emmett and Lois Johnson who were killed while out camping near Eli, Nevada. Suddenly Knowles abducted a 42-year-old Charlene Hicks while she was on the side of the road and dumped her body in a rest stop in Seguin, Texas. Other victims fell prey to the charm and affability of the man who would come to be known as the Casanova Killer, who could turn on the charm seemingly whenever he wanted to. 32-year-old William Bates was last seen alive sharing a few drinks with Knowles in a roadside pub near Lima, Ohio. He was having a good time and perhaps thinking he'd made himself a new friend. But Knowles was only interested in one thing, Bates's car, and he strangled his drinking buddy, dumped him in the woods and drove off in his new ride. In Birmingham, Alabama, Knowles made the acquaintance of a 49-year-old beautician called Anne Dawson. The pair travelled together for a while, and we don't know if Dawson went along willingly or was simply one of Knowles' other kidnapping victims. It kind of was his thing. Either way, it made little difference. Once Knowles grew tired of her, Anne Dawson suffered the same fate as everybody else. The killer strangled her and discarded her body in the Mississippi River, where it remained undiscovered for a further three years. In October, Knowles passed through Connecticut and Virginia before returning to his classic hunting grounds in Georgia and Florida. In Marlborough, Connecticut, Knowles broke into the home of Karen Wine, who lived with her teenage daughter Dawn. He murdered both women simply for the thrill of it because he didn't steal anything from the house, leading the authorities to conclude that he simply killed them because he wanted to. In fact, the only thing he took from the home, besides those two women's lives, was a tape recorder which he later used to record a long confession, giving detailed accounts of the 14 murders he committed in eight different states. Knowles then gave the tape to a lawyer in Florida and it was later used in his trial to identify some of his victims. And we're not really sure why Knowles did this. It certainly wasn't because he intended to give himself up or stop killing or because he started to feel remorse. Just a few days later, he entered the home of Doris Hoveley in Woodford, Virginia and shot her with her husband's rifle. Yeah, and 
We're still not done. Back in Florida, still driving William Bates' stolen car, Knowles picked up two hitchhikers in Key West. He obviously had some criminal intentions in mind, but was pulled over by a policeman for a traffic violation. The hitchhikers might have thought this was bad luck, but they didn't know how wrong they were. And even though the cop let Knowles off with just a warning, the experience threw him off his game, at least enough that he decided to drop off his riding companions in Miami safe and sound. Again, this is an exceedingly rare example of someone who got close to this man and lived to tell the tale. Noel start in November with two double murders. He is strongly suspected of killing a young hitchhiking couple near Macon, Georgia on November 2nd. Then, a few days later, Knowles once again turned on his murderous charm and befriended a man he met in a bar named Carswell Carr. The two got on so well that Carr invited his new companion back home to spend the night, but this would be a decision that would cost him very dearly. The very next day, Carr was found bound and naked with 27 stab wounds on his body from a pair of scissors found in his own home, while his teenage daughter Mandy had been strangled with a pair of her own nylon stockings. A couple of days later, Knowles was prowling the bars of Atlanta looking for a new target, which is where he made the acquaintance of the aforementioned Sandy Forks, a British journalist with the Daily Express who was in America hoping to score some big interviews. As we said before, she thought that Knowles was a very handsome man and the two hit it off immediately. Forks knew him as Daryl Golden, no, no ego there, and the two not only went home together, but they spent the next several days together as well. They reportedly tried having sex several times, but Knowles could not shall we say, rise to the occasion. Forks would later speculate that the killer was impotent with a willing participant, but we don't really know for sure. Despite feeling extreme frustration, Knowles allowed the journalist to leave unharmed, and it's not really clear why, as he had no qualms about killing people for far less in the past. And it is suggested that he let Forks live because he figured she could be his ticket to notoriety. We are talking about him in a YouTube video that we're hoping lots of people click, so I, I, I guess. And reportedly, Knowles did ask Fork several times if she ever intended to write a book and even suggested that she could write one about him, which she did a few years later, titling it uncreatively, Killing Time. After the car double murders, Knowles was starting to feel the net tighten around him. On November 16th, 1974, patrolman Charles Campbell pulled him over near Perry, Florida. Unfortunately for him, Knowles was quicker to react and stole his gun, driving away in the very cop car that Campbell pulled him over in, with Campbell in the back as a hostage. Because two were always better than one, Knowles used the siren to pull over a random motorist named James Mayer, took him hostage as well, and when he reached a wooded area, he then handcuffed both men to a tree and shot them in the back of the head. Don't worry, Knowles gets his. The following day, Knowles ran into a police roadblock outside of Stocksbridge, Georgia. Literally, as in, he tried smashing through it but totaled his vehicle and fled on foot through the woods. For several hours, he managed to evade the police, police dogs, and even several helicopters until he ran into a civilian named David Clark. Knowles had hoped that he could use his tried and true charm to convince or perhaps coerce the man into helping him, but he was out of luck on that one. Clark was a Vietnam vet armed with a shotgun and he knew exactly who was stood in front of him. The murderer known as the Casanova Killer. He held Knowles at gunpoint until the police arrived was finally in custody. Once Knowles had been arrested, he confessed to killing 18 different people, but later boasted of committing up to 35 murders. Again, we don't know exactly how many people Knowles killed, but 18 is the number that we definitively know for sure. It's likely that he killed many other people during his spree, because that was, yeah, that was kind of his thing for a while. So it was pretty obvious that his trial would be a mere formality at that point. They literally caught him red-handed and they had his own words as a confession, but his case never even got as far as a trial because on December 18th, 1974, Knowles was being transferred to a new facility in a car with Sheriff Early and Georgia Bureau of Investigations agent Ronnie Angel. Knowles made a grab for Lee's gun, but this time he did not win out. Agent Angel drew his outside arm and shot Paul Knowles three times in the chest, killing him on the spot. And thus ended the tale of the Casanova killer. So I hope everybody out there found this video to be educational, entertaining and informative. I certainly found the script to be all three of those things and while the subject matter is something that's uh, not my cup of tea, I am aware that the true crime genre and the darkly fascinating are something that is interesting to people out there. So if you are one of the people who enjoyed this video, let us know by leaving a like, a comment, subscribe. And I feel so bad saying that in a video where a guy admitted to killing 18 people. <laughs> It's so weird. My job is so weird sometimes. I'm at a Christmas party later. 
I was wearing a Christmas jumper before I started recording this video. It's so strange. It's just over there. I can see my Christmas presents in the corner of the room. There's a, there's a, there's a tree and everything. Thank you to everyone for watching. Go give the author of this piece some love. Radio Alexander. You can find him on the socials link below. I'm sure they would appreciate being told that their efforts to research such a macabre and awful case weren't in vain. And yeah, just to everyone out there, um, go out there and have the day you deserve. And just, yeah, I never know how to end these, ever.